Welcome to Kerr 9000's Horror House. Okay, so after Halloween 3, which had no real connection to the earlier films, for Halloween 4, the producers very quickly turned back to telling the story of Michael Myers. Jamie Lee Curtis was unwilling to return to the role of Laurie Strode, so this meant that her character was killed off. This is where I have to say something which might prove a little bit unpopular. I really did not give a monkey that Jamie Lee Curtis didn't return. I know this might annoy some people, but as far as I'm concerned, Strode is not the main nemesis for Michael. I see Dr. Loomis as the main force which stands against Myers. As long as we have the excellent Donald Pleasance in a Halloween film, then I'm a very happy fellow. In fact, despite loving Halloween 3 to pieces, I still wish that somehow there could be just a little bit of Loomis in that one. To me, he's very much the Van Helsing of the series, an expert in the war against evil and a main foil for our villain. I guess before I go into what Halloween 4 is, I should have a quick shout out about what it could have become. I have heard rumours that if the whole anthology film idea of each Halloween being about something different had worked, that this film would have been a ghost related movie. Finding evidence for this seems to be hard though. What it is easier to find evidence for though is that at one point when Carpenter was more connected to the film they wanted to bring Myers back as a spirit. The idea was that Haddonfield, the film series setting, has decided to ban Halloween and not allow cinemas to show horror films or kids to trick or treat and that somehow this, if it happened, would bring Michael back as a spirit. That he'd be reborn in a pumpkin field as some kind of vengeance ghost. On the one hand, this sounds a little bit silly, and also a little bit close to Nightmare on Elm Street. But then I guess it's no sillier than a guy who can be killed again and again to somehow seem to come back and have only been in a coma or knocked out. Okay, so let's leave behind what could have been and instead focus on the film we got. So we'll start at the start with the most basic questions. What has Michael been doing since the second one? Well, he has been sat in a comatose state for 10 years since the explosion at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital. So not very much at all, to be fair. It is while Michael is being transferred to Smith's Grove Sanatorium by ambulance that he wakes up after hearing that Laurie Strode, who died in a car accident, has a daughter. So I guess lesson learned right here. If you're ever around a comatose killer, just keep your mouth shut, just in case anything you say could wake them up and start the whole thing again. Okay, if you want to watch the film without having it spoiled, I recommend you walk away now. As although I'm not going to give away every beat of the film, I will spoil the ending as well. I can't talk about the movie's place in canon without doing this. Okay, so let's get back to talking about this movie. So where was I? Oh yes, Michael being Michael kills the ambulance personnel and makes his way to Haddonsfield in search of his niece, Jamie. Dr. Samuel Loomis basically gives chase and it's pretty much business as usual for the pair. Michael killing and Loomis telling people that Michael is evil while trying to track him down so that he can stop him. All in all, as far as I am concerned, it's more of the same as far as the franchise goes. It takes on board the first two Halloween films while ignoring the third, with this once again being the story of Michael. Near the end of the film, just before Michael is finished off, Jamie touches his hand. Then when things have apparently gone back to normal after the events, her stepmom goes upstairs to run her a bath. At this point though, Jamie attacks old mummy dearest. Loomis hears screaming and starts to race up the stairs before stopping dead in his tracks about midway. We see why he's stopped. There at the top of the stairs stands an emotionless looking Jamie who's wearing a clown mask, holding a pair of scissors in her hand. Her costume covered in blood, looking pretty much like a young Michael had when he killed his older sister Judith. Loomis raises his gun to shoot, but he's stopped. The film ends with Loomis sinking to the floor, sobbing, leading us to believe that for one reason or another, be it something in her blood, the trauma she'd suffered, or some kind of curse passing from her uncle when they touched, that this has led to Jamie becoming the franchise's new killer. Would this change of killer ending go on to be an important piece of canon or not? Well, I guess you need to wait for my next video to find out. Well, unless you watch these films when they came out, that is. If I was to give this film a score, while well, not quite the classic the original was, I enjoy it. I'd give it a hearty 80 movies, 7 out of 10. Okay, it's Kern 9000 signing off saying keep on watching those scary movies, boys and ghouls. Laters, taters. Hi, it's Kern 9000. Thank you for checking out my video and for making it to the end. If you'd like to subscribe then there'll be a little thing for you to click on right near the end and you'll also see a link to one of my videos and one of my playlists. I make reviews of horror films, both modern and retro video game reviews, science fiction film reviews and all kinds of other stuff. I even show off some of my collection. You can also find me on the Retro Gamer unofficial forum 
which is a great place for retro gaming chat and it keeps on growing every day. It's well worth checking out. Once again, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye.